Did you see Jordan Love? It's part of a new workout video that just dropped. It was him and the backup quarterback for the Steelers, Justin Fields. You know, but he was working on footwork, and I gotta say, I think he better start stretching out his hand because uh, he's gonna have to work his way into a new contract soon. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Marty Town Bruiser. I'm your host, John Delray. Today is part four. We are going to go through the Packers roster numbers 39 all the way on down to 22 with a fact about every single one of these guys. Something pertinent to their life on the football field for some, maybe something a little off the field, something that may be um, educational about their background. So let's get right into it. We kick off today with Zane Anderson. And then, of course, tomorrow we're going to finish off 21 to the end. And then the series is complete. But 39, Zane Anderson. And here's the deal with Zane. There are not too many championship winners on the Green Bay Packers. Like, if you look at their whole 90-man roster, there's not exactly a lot of rings there. But, I mean, like, think about that, right? It makes a lot of sense. They're, they were the youngest roster in the NFL last year. Even some of their more aged guys, like Preston Smith. I mean, he spent years in Washington. He did not get a ring in Washington. Zane Anderson, though, he's one of the few exceptions to the rule. Before being claimed by the Green Bay Packers, Anderson spent two years with the Kansas City Chiefs, where he was a member of the 2022 championship team. His contributions, yes, they were fairly minimal. He played in a grand total of three games. He did not record a single stat, but a ring nonetheless makes him stand out in amongst these young Green Bay Packers. Moving on to jersey number 38, that is Ellis Merriweather, the practice squad running back. And with a stat that, you know, college kind of muddies the things in a lot of different ways, right? Stats aren't always to be trusted at face value, but sometimes... They are quite indicative of what's going on, and for Merriweather, it's not exactly great when you comp him to other Packer running backs. See, he posted the lowest yards per carry collegiately out of any running back on the roster. Josh Jacobs posted a ridiculous 5.9 yards per carry. A.J. Dillon, 5.2. Marshawn Lloyd, after his great year at USC this last year, raised his average up to 5.6. Emmanuel Wilson... A ridiculous 6.3. Even Jarvian Howard with his years at Syracuse and then Alcorn State, 4.8. And then there's Merriweather down there at 4.5. And it's been a trend for him not to have the greatest yards per carry because even when last season, he was given several chances by the Saints. He was on their practice squad. They had some running backs hurt. They weren't going to play Kamara in the preseason, etc. It's so like Merriweather got his chances. But he only logged 73 yards on 22 carries in the preseason for the Saints. So it's a little bit of a trend that he seems to lag behind others in yards per carry. Certainly a trend he's looking to reverse. Next up, number 37, Carrington Valentine. I got to tell you if, you, if you're not on the Packers social channels and you have yet to hear Carrington Valentine's laugh, go look it up. Look up some videos that Carrington Valentine's in. It is very enjoyable. I'm all for like giving him the nickname of Joker. But Carrington Valentine, he had a reputation coming out of college of being a press man cornerback before he made his way to Green Bay in the seventh round last year. But what if I tell you that in spite of playing roughly 20% of his snaps in man coverage, he actually statistically performed better as a zone cornerback last year. See, in man coverage, he allowed a 66.7% catch rate, which was bottom 15 of all cornerbacks who had at least 400 total coverage snaps. Whereas in zone, it was a full 6% lower, only 60%. Yards per catch was also lower in zone by nearly a half yard. And of course, like all these things that I'm going to say, there is context here. Are you taking into account the, the Joe Barry effect? Well, I mean, this coverage, it does kind of stand out. And it is surprising for a press man corner like Valentine to have worse numbers doing what he supposedly does best versus zone which had better numbers. Next up, number 36, that's Anthony Johnson Jr., the apple of my eye. You don't want to know why I was so high on him last year, why I continue to like him so much. Like, I loved the story in college because he was a college corner at Iowa State, one of the best defenses in the country. Year in and year out, he was one of their starting corners. And then they went to him before his final year of college, and they said, hey, we got a big old hole at safety. We want you to learn this new position. Can you switch to safety? And he said, yeah, sure. 
it'll help the team. And that was in spite of the fact that like it very well could have hurt his draft stock to learn an all new position right before he was going to be draft eligible. And I love that he was a good enough college player to do that so seamlessly. But the real thing is he seems like an incredibly stand up human being off the field. And I always root for those guys. And you can tell just from his resume. See, in his time at Iowa State, he was the first recipient and the second recipient. He ran the first two years of this scholarship of the Jack Trice Scholarship, which is awarded at Iowa State to a black student athlete on the football team who's entering a senior year. So, yeah, kind of a narrow scope there. But a person who portrays courage, character, selflessness, leadership, dedication to the community and academic and athletic achievement. He was also on the Big 12 Honor Roll on multiple occasions and was nominated for the AFCA Good Works Team, which attempts to recognize players nationwide for the work that they do in their communities. Anthony Johnson Jr., by all accounts, stand-up guy. Next up, number 35, that's Jarvian Howard. Jarvian Howard started his college career at Syracuse but found playing time kind of hard to come by, so instead he went to Alcorn State University. There, he made his presence known. He ran for 1,239 yards and 12 touchdowns in his first year, and then he became the SWAC Newcomer of the Year. That, in turn, has led him to being just the second Alcorn State alum to spend their rookie season with the Packers, assuming, of course, he sticks around. The other? Just some dude named Donald Driver. Number 34, Kalen King. Much has been talked about already about Kalen King, just from the regard of this dude was supposed to be one of the top corners of this draft. Why did the Packers get him in round seven? You may be wondering why. So there's at least some background here statistically that we can offer, right? And I'm not kidding. Like to say that he was projected to be an early round pick before the last college football season began, it's not just blowing smoke. Like, he had a number of preseason accolades, including he was first-team preseason All-American honors from the Associated Press, Sporting News, and PFF. He was named to the Bednarik Award, the Bronco Nagurski Trophy, the Jim Thorpe Award, and the Lot Impact Trophy watch list that came out before the season. And then the season just did not go his way. Statistically speaking, there's a couple things. In 2022, he had 21 passes defended. Good for third in the FBS. This year, two. 21 and 2 are not the same. His quarterback rating also skyrocketed 48.9 the year before, all the way to 92.4 this last year. So it's tough to gauge why exactly these things occurred, right? Tough to gauge the full, broader picture. But there is one potential reasoning here. It's logical to conclude that he truly reaped the benefits of playing next to Joey Porter Jr. <coughs> Maybe he just needs a great corner coverage opposite him to really be his most successful there are guys like that certainly maybe a guy like jay alexander next up number 33 the new number 33 in green base and Aaron jones is left to make it is uh evan williams the man this dude can get after the quarterback he was sent to rush the passer on only 20 snaps last year for oregon but he turned those 20 snaps into absolute mega production out of 20 snaps he logged eight pressures five sacks one hit and two hurries just absurd 20 snaps eight pressures five sacks one hit and two hurries this gave him the second highest prp which is pff's metric for impact and pass rush relative to amount of playing time doing pass rush so he ranked second highest out of all safeties last year and he was the top converter of pressures into sacks in the country Using PFF's tracking, those five sacks he mustered were tied for the second most of all safeties in college football last year. But here's what sets him apart. See, it's not good enough to just be tied second. We got to find the additional (laughs) info around that. Evan Williams did it in 20 snaps. The guy that he tied with that had five sacks as well needed 30 snaps. The one guy that beat them both, the guy who finished first, yeah, he got nine sacks but he did it in nearly five times the snaps as he was sent to go with the quarterback 97 times, resulting in nine sacks. That's not the same as Williams being sent 20 and getting five sacks. Put him in the box. Let's have some fun. Next up, number 32, Marshawn Lloyd. I'm just going to borrow this. Like I talked about this when I covered the rookie facts, like right after they were drafted, and it's still just super interesting. So I wanted to just straight up say it again. 
The third round selection for the Green Bay Packers is a really weird thing with the number three. His 177 elusiveness score granted by PFF finishes him third amongst all running backs with at least as many carries as he had. His breakaway percentage of 56.7% was also third highest. His yards per carry of 7.1? Mm-hmm. Third highest. And his run blocking score? Third highest as well. And then it gets weirder. He had three fumbles as well. Which, unfortunately, of players with three or more fumbles, Lloyd had the fewest carries. So, yeah, like, I know it's obviously something that he's working on. The Fleur Goot, they both have talked about how it's not really a concern, what have you. But weird thing, weird statistical correlation here with Lloyd being in third for basically every category and having three fumbles. It's a good thing three is retired in Green Bay. Next up, 31, Emmanuel Wilson. After leading the NFL in rushing yards last preseason, Wilson did not have the most opportunities during the regular season but he did at least get 26 rushing attempts and he made at least a good chunk of them count. Wilson's 25.6% breakaway rate was the highest of any Packer running back last year. Breakaway rate, if you don't know, it's basically like how many of your runs get over 15 yards as long as they're designed runs, not like scrambles or, or, you know, stuff like that. So 25.6% of his runs went over 15 yards as long as they were designed runs. That ranked ranked him 28th in the NFL amongst all running backs with at least 20 carries. That list, though, it's 85 guys. Well, 28th doesn't sound all that impressive. On a list of 85, it ain't bad. Next up, number 30, that is Zion Gilbert. Zion Gilbert didn't do a whole lot for most of his rookie season in 2022 after he signed as a UDFA with the Giants. But when he got some playing time, he did burst onto the scene quite loudly. In his Week 13 debut, he played 56 snaps and recorded six tackles. The downside, he allowed six catches. So I don't know. I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't go back and watch the game, but there's reason to believe that his six tackles came on the six receptions that he allowed. But nonetheless, still six tackles. But in Week 14, he continued to see playing time as guys were still hurt. It just wasn't as much playing time, and he registered his first career sack. When looking into the Giants' side of things, the Giants' coverage of him, there seems to be this consensus from everyone around the word that he's feisty. Honestly, kind of sounds like a perfect fit for what Green Bay's trying to do in the secondary. Next up, 29, another former Giant, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Xavier McKinney. Xavier McKinney, he's been an above-average safety for most of his four years in the NFL. And if you want to make the argument that it's been every single play, yeah, like I, I get it. Just looking from a number standpoint, you can officially say above average for the vast majority of his time, three years at least. But last year is when he truly ascended to being one of the elite. I personally would argue that he was the second most impactful safety in football last year behind just Antoine Winfield Jr. So what changed last year? What made it all click from going to like above average safety to out of this world, one of the most elite in the league? And it very well could have been his usage in the Giants defense. In 2021, McKinney played in the box on just 13% of his snaps. 2022, it rose to 24%. Last year, it continued to go up, this time to 35%. He also saw his usage in the slot nearly double from 8% to 14%. See, the Giants seemed to learn last year that McKinney is a weapon. He's the X factor, if you will, no matter where we put him. Just keep shifting him around. It's like the Giants learned it so that the Packers can truly put it into practice this year. Next up, number 28, A.J. Dillon. If you're on the YouTube side of things, what a nice picture of A.J. Dillon, right? Okay. One of the reasons A.J. Dillon might be sticking around is not just his knowledge of the offense, but actually how he's used in it. I thought this was a very, very interesting nugget. See, because it's believed that the Packers, based upon little things that they've said, as well as some of their transitions, that they're looking to move more a little bit away from the zone running system and into more of a gap running system. And one of the reasons for that, beyond what they've said, is they got rid of Aaron Jones, who very much was a zone running back and brought in Josh Jacobs, who's had his most success in the NFL as a gap running back. If you look at 2022 for Josh Jacobs, by far his most successful year, dude ran more gap than ever. This year when he wasn't as successful, granted there was other O-line problems and all that jazz, uh, he didn't run as much gap. He wasn't as successful. So Dylan already runs, like he already knows the offense compared to the other running backs. All right, let's give him that. But he also already runs more gap style runs than anyone else on the roster. 
Here's the breakdown. Aaron Jones ran an appropriate 33% of his carries were gap runs. Patrick Taylor, 40%. Emmanuel Wilson, 38%. But A.J. Dillon, 45%. Highest rate on the team last year. Uh, next up, 27, Keaton Aladapo. Once a day, every day in this series, I highlight one guy that has something really stand out in the stop department. Well, today, Aladapo fits the bill. Last year, he had 17 total tackles and 11 assists, along with 23 stops. He had six more stops than he did solo tackles. The year prior, he almost did it again. 15 stops with 16 solo tackles. By the way, I just want to give you more numbers about Aladapo, so this is more than one fact, but like, bear with me. In the last two years, his missed tackle rate has been only 8.4% and 12.1%. And I wouldn't be shocked, really. Like, if the Packers, when they go to Big Dime, roll out two slot players, basically. I know there's talk about, like, Bullard may play in the slot a little bit when they go to that system. Certainly, you got Keyshawn Nixon, who's your slot starter for all intents and purposes. But Aladapo shouldn't be forgotten there. Like he's got some experience in the slot. So last year, he played nearly as many snaps as a slot cornerback as he did as a safety in the box. That seems like it shouldn't be forgotten about. Also, I wanted to include this too. I just want to give you the grades because they're awfully McKinney-like. His overall grade last year, 88.3. His run defense grade, 91.3. Tackling, 78.3. Pass rush, 67.1. Coverage, 84.4. McKinney, Bullard, Aladapo, mm -hmm, my heart is a flutter. Next up, number 26, that would be Corey Ballantyne. You know, sometimes players just need to play. And maybe that's the case for Ballantyne. See, he was originally brought into the Packers as a special teams corner. I don't think there's really much doubt about that. But when he was thrust into duty last year because of all the injuries to the cornerbacks, he played better as a corner than he ever had before in his career. See, his first three years in the league, yes, very small sample sizes, but nonetheless, it remains true. His first three years in the league, he was targeted a grand total of 54 times. Over those 54 targets, he gave up 40 catches for 503 yards, and he never allowed a quarterback rating under triple digits. But then all of a sudden, last year, in perfect synchrony, he was targeted 54 times last year alone. And when he conceded only 32 catches, a less, 392 yards, over 100 yards less, and a quarterback rating of 80.2, under triple digits for the first time. I'm not saying he's a world beater alpha corner, like I'm not saying all of a sudden start him for sure, but some guys just need to play. And maybe that's the case for Corey Ballantyne. Next up, number 25, Keyshawn Nixon. In just five years as a professional football player, Keyshawn Nixon has been an all-pro twice. It's just not at the position he happens to actually freaking play the most. But, get this, he is only the fourth kick returner in history to be an all-pro in back-to-back -back years for kick returning. The others were Cordero Patterson, who actually achieved it twice, Devin Hester, and Mel Gray back in 1990. Literally three of the best returners ever. Keyshawn Nixon is now amongst them. All told, Patterson wound up making seven All-Pro teams when you do first and second team All-Pros. Hester made four. Frankly, I was surprised to see Patterson had made that many more than Hester, but nonetheless, Patterson seven, Hester four, and Gray made four as well. Maybe with the new rules that are encouraging returning, even though Keyshawn already returned it a bunch more than anybody else in the NFL, but maybe with these new rules, with the new blocking formations and all that that teams get to do, maybe Keyshawn will get catapulted to being the first ever Three time in a row win. Next up, number 24, Tyler Coyle. Tyler Coyle is a convert. And what I mean by that is he spent time with the Dallas Cowboys with a few games on their active roster in 21 and 22, getting nine total tackles before being let go and signing with Green Bay's practice squad. But before he was trying to make it in the NFL as a member of the secondary, according to 247 Sports, he actually entered college as a wide receiver prospect who eventually switched to the defensive side of the ball. Next up, number 23, Jair Alexander. Oh, Jair. What is there to say about Jair Alexander that hasn't been said so much from everyone for years? Not a lot. So let's lean into a narrative a little bit. I have fallen victim to it. I swear to goodness, it's the eye test that's there. 
But there's this notion that ever since he hurt his shoulder, Jerry Alexander is not as willing and does not tackle as well as he used to. And you know, tackling, kind of a big deal around here. But there's this big thing that, like, Jair doesn't want to play the run anymore. He just can't tackle because of the shoulders. And I, I'll admit, like, when you watch him, yeah, it looks like he doesn't go barreling in as hard as he used to. Maybe he's not as willing. And the numbers aren't going to show that, but it's like you can see it. Okay, but let's look at the numbers and see what they do say. Because they show that Jair can still tackle when in the right position. In fact... His worst year at tackling was his second year in the league. He had a missed tackle rate of 15.7%. That's his worst. If you recall yesterday, I talked about Rashawn Gary in three of his five years hovering around 15%. So Jair, even in his worst year, is not at all a bad tackler. But since then, four years since that year, these are his rates. 8.5%, 12.5%. 9.5%, and then last year, 136 Again, still not matching his worst. And if you look into this, it's not really that he's tackling less either, because I, I thought maybe like looking at these stats, I was like, okay, fine, like the missed tackle rates are at least hovering where they've always been, but like maybe he's tackling way less. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe he's just not diving in for these tackle attempts. Not really. See, if you look at his first two years of career, yes, he did have more tackles earlier on in his career. He also was targeted way more in the first two years of his career. And there's always for corners this correlation between targets and tackles, right? Makes a lot of sense. Well, if you go throughout the span of his career, his tackle numbers seem to correlate like the correlation arc stays pretty in line per targets, catches, and tackles. So this truly is a case where it's like, maybe our eyes are lying to us. Maybe just the the aggressive tackling isn't there, but the dude's still doing it. The numbers show it. So maybe this is one case where like our eyes are lying to us. Maybe the stats aren't showing the whole picture. Maybe it's a little bit of both. Maybe the reputation is a little worse than the stats. Maybe the stats are a little bit better than what we see. We'll find out this year. I think it's going to be an excellent text. Next up. Number 22, the last player of today, Robert Rochelle. And look, I'm not going to lie to you. When Robert Rochelle was signed, I'm sure I read about him. I'm sure I, like, I researched the signing and all that kind of stuff. But like, I do not remember about Robert Rochelle's background like at all when I was doing this. Because like, look, he had been on two practice squads and, and he was signed. And it was like, oh, yeah, that's a nice like bottom of the roster signing. We need corners. Hey, he's a corner. Like, all right. Like, it's one of those types, right? There's more here, because maybe you recall, uh, I'm, like, maybe you do, but I certainly didn't. But Robert Rochelle was a fourth-round pick for the Rams in 2021. That rookie season, he even started five games for them and played over 200 snaps as the Rams went on to win the Super Bowl. It was a promising, it wasn't perfect, but it was a promising rookie year for a Super Bowl-winning team. And it ended with him an injury. It's not like he was benched. And then the next year just 26 snaps before being released the following offseason. In those two years, though, all told, he picked up 19 tackles, four passes defensed, he gave up a quarterback rating of 88.8 as a rookie, and he logged in an interception. There might truly be something to work with here for Green Bay, but I can't tell you what went wrong with the Rams. Hopefully, it just doesn't happen here. Thanks so much for joining me here on the Marty Time Brews. I'm going to be back tomorrow for part five getting through with this project going from eric stokes through number well now zero is a valid number so i suppose we'll talk about that but eric stokes rounding out the roster and then that propels us into next week as we continue to prepare for packers training camp thanks so much for joining me i do hope you are having a fantastic day and as always go pack go go